I'm going to look at these three concepts out of um, research methods on the experiment. And three key concepts are hypotheses, variables, and design. First of all, then, what's a hypothesis? Well, we say it's a prediction or a guess we make about the relationship between two things. And we call these the independent and the dependent variables. We use this language of dependency because we think of the hypothesis as a statement about one thing depending on another. So, for example, we could predict, make a, a hypothesis, that stress depends upon the number of significant life events a person has experienced. So that your level of stress measured in some way depends upon the number of significant life events. And by significant life events, I mean things like um, divorce, death of a close relative, uh, being made redundant, that kind of stuff. Okay, so if we know what a hypothesis is, when it uses these variables, what's a variable? Well, as the name suggests, a variable is anything that can take different values, like height or IQ, ethnicity or stress. We're interested in variables because when we test hypotheses, we do this by changing the value of one variable, called the independent variable, and measuring any change in the value of another one that we call the dependent variable. And there's that language of dependency again. The DV depends upon the IV. So there are essentially only three ways that this can happen, this dependency relationship. First of all, you could have a situation where if you have more of one thing, you get more of another. So if you increase the independent variable, you see an increase in the dependent variable. Mathematically, we write that like that. We say the independent variable is directly proportional to the dependent variable. Alternatively, we could say the more of the first thing you have, the less of the second you get. Mathematically, we write that like this. We say the independent variable is indirectly proportional to the dependent variable. Um, so, for example, with this first one here, that could be like uh, height and shoe size. Generally speaking, the taller you are, the bigger your feet. In the second one, that could be ambient temperature, you know, how hot it is. And this could be amount of clothes worn, because clearly the warmer it is, the more clothing you tend to wear. Finally, we could also have a relationship of no relationship. That is to say, it doesn't matter what you do to the independent variable, the dependent variable doesn't seem to be affected by it at all. So here's a, an illustrating example. This is Fat Reg and the parachutists. So Fat Reg is sat on the, um, the park seesaw in the, in the playground at the back of the local pub, obviously, eating pies and drinking beer. And for reasons best known to himself, he has decided to have a bunch of tiny little parachutists land on the other end of the seesaw. Now, clearly, there's a relationship between the number of parachutists and Reg's height off the ground. So that's the, the thing we're talking about, so that this is the one variable and this is the other. His height depends upon their number. Okay, so if that's hypotheses and variables, when we manipulate the independent variable and measure the dependent variable like this, well, that's like the essence of an experiment. I know there are a number of different sorts, naturalistic and field and lab and all the rest of it, and what I'm describing is essentially a laboratory experiment. Nevertheless, it's, that's like our ideal paradigmatic form of the experiment. And we have that in mind because, provided we can be confident that the independent variable is the only thing that could have caused changes in the dependent variable, well, then we can use the results, the measurements that we made of the dependent variable, as evidence to support a valid conclusion about our hypothesis. And the validity here is internal to the experiment, it's internal validity. So that's why we're concerned with it. So how do we make sure that the independent variable is the only thing that's changing the dependent variable? Well, we've got three things that we're going to have a look at. So first of all, identify the things that could cause variations in the dependent variable. And we call those extraneous variables. Um, if we think about Fat Reg and the parachutists, other things might cause differences in his height off the ground. For example, whether he sits up or, or stands or slouches. So those things, you'd have to have the same posture, otherwise that could influence the height of his head off the ground. The next thing that we've got, we're going to work out which of the extraneous variables might need to be controlled. Which ones are actually going to have meaningful effects and which ones would only be negligible. Clearly, if Reg had spiked his hair, that would have an effect on his overall height. But it would be a small effect, and we could say it was negligible, and we wouldn't need to control for it. It would not be potentially confounding. However, if he sits up or slouches, that could potentially confound the results, and so we would need to control for that. Finally, oops, 
finally, we really need to figure out ways to control these potentially confounding variables through control strategies. Uh, control strategies are the most important factor to take into account when we're designing an experiment. So what's the big deal with experimental design then? Well, experimental design is a matter of balancing a number of potentially conflicting requirements. I go with four. You, you might be able to think of others, but generally speaking. The first one is this business of control. You've got to control the potentially confounding extraneous variables, otherwise your results will be completely invalid. I mean, you might be right. You, you might conclude something that's actually true, but you would do so for no good reason, and therefore your results would not be admitted as evidence. So this gives us confidence that any change we observe in the DV can be attributed to alterations made in the IV. Second thing, when we make the DV measurable, yeah, this is called operationalization, you might have heard that word, there's different levels of measurement that can be achieved depending on what sorts of scales of measurement are applied. I'm not going to go into the detail of that here, there is another cast on that available. Third consideration, you've got to minimise the artificiality of the experiment so that the behaviour being observed is comparable to the real-life situation. This sometimes gets called ecological validity. Sometimes you might even see it called external validity. So that internal validity is that the data that you collected tests the hypothesis you are actually stating. External validity is that your hypothesis and conclusions are relevant to the real-world experience that you're trying to, to identify or think about. Finally, and by no means least, you've got to take into account ethical considerations. It doesn't matter what research activity we're doing, there is no activity that is completely devoid of ethical considerations. Some are more obvious than others, but each experiment, each research, has its ethical considerations to be considered. And our reason for doing this is not to make us nice guys, or to make us feel good and have a fuzzy glow inside. It's because we must not undermine the public's confidence in what we do. If we're practicing psychology, which is primarily what I was thinking of, and we do experiments like the Milgram experiment or the um, Ash experiment, people will form the impression that psychologists are a bunch of you know, mendacious, lying so-and-sos who you can't trust. And they will be less likely to volunteer to participate in our experiments. And even if they do participate, they'll be more likely to try and second-guess us. So we have to work with these ethical questions considerations in order to protect our standing with the general public, in order to sustain the, the practice of psychology or, or any other social science research. So those are our four big considerations there that should make our experiment uh, basically a valid design. All right, so what are the three formal experimental designs then? So we've got, first of all, the independent groups design. Now, the independent groups design comes in two or more groups of participants. Basically, stick to two, it's simplest, but you could, in theory, have many groups and vary each one against the other. So the grouping is how we manipulate the IV. Here's some examples to illustrate the idea. First of all, we could try to see, uh, we test the hypothesis that sex causes differences in the estimation of risk. So we'd start off by separating our participants into males and females before we gave them a number of scenarios to estimate the degree of risk with. And we'd go with the classic sexist line that women tend to be more cautious than men and therefore we would expect that women would produce a higher estimate of risk if we gave them a 10-point scale or whatever. And then we could compare the two results. Separating the participants into the groups by their sex, that's what allows us to manipulate the IV sex of participant. Then we measure their estimates of risk. risk. Then we've got um, another hypothesis here. This time we're going with um, recall from short-term memory depends upon rehearsal. You know that business of saying things back over to yourself, either out loud or in your own head. So we'd start by dividing participants into two groups. Each group gets to see the same list of stimulus material. Then one group is allowed to rehearse this material before being asked to recall it. But the others give an articulatory suppression task. That's that famous, you, you get people to say a word over and over like cola, cola, cola. Or you could say to them that the classic is the Brown Peterson counting backwards in threes from a very large number like this chap's doing here. He's giving it a 357, 354, 354, doing his best. Now, this articulatory suppression task, that's what prevents the rehearsal, and that's how we're manipulating the IV. So, in the first example that we had before, with the women and the men and the sex and the um, estimate of risk, we did stuff, we manipulated the IV by looking at the way we sampled. Here we manipulate the IV through uh, instrumental procedures. The next one we've got here. Let's say we want to investigate the effect of subliminal stimulus on arousal. 
Okay, so we're investigating that business about can I can I give you an image that's faster than your conscious mind can uh, recognize, but it still influences you in some way. So <clears throat> we're going to use a thing called a tachistoscope, and it flashes images at participant size at rates faster than conscious attention. So typically we'd be looking at something at more than 30 frames per second. You know? So uh, we flash up an image, or we flash up a 30 second, uh, sorry, 30 frames in one second, and on one of those frames we would have something that would be causing distress in some way. Then we will wire up our participants to a galvanic skin response measurer, um, cardiogram to detect changes in heartbeat, we'll videograph their cam uh, we'll video camera their eyes and look at pupil dilation. We'll use those objective measures to see about you know, what level of stress they're under, what level of arousal they experience. So one group of participants is presented with a series of emotionally neutral words like table and telescope and things like that and the other group gets to see a stream of graphically offensive language. I won't repeat them here because I'm sure you probably know far more of those rude words than I do. That's a tachistoscope there. That's the kind of device I'm talking about. This is a really old version of it. You get more modern ones now using computers and things. And this, this poor lady here is being flashed a sequence of images. I'm not saying that it's necessarily the, the arousal experiment I'm looking at. So when we split the participants into the two groups, one seeing the subliminal messages and the other not, that's how we manipulate the IV there. So here it was giving them tasks to do, and here it's controlling what they're exposed to. But essentially what we're doing is splitting them into two groups by procedural methods. Now we go to the repeated measures design. Here all the participants take part in each condition in the experiment. For example, if we had a drug trial, participants are given a placebo for the first part of the trial and then an active compound in the second. We then measure the effect of the active compound in the treatment of the disorder by observing symptoms and maybe asking them to report their own individual condition. The problem with this, of course, is that uh, it depends on which order you do the administration. So if you give them the placebo first and then the, the active compound second, <coughs> if the placebo has no effect on their illness, then their illness is likely to get worse over time. And so by the time we come to seeing what effect the active compound has, their disease has already got worse anyway. So it kind of undermines the, the effectiveness of the, or it undermines our measure of the effectiveness of the active compound. Obviously, if we did the thing in reverse and gave the active compound first and then the placebo, it might make the placebo look more effective than what it truly is. Well, the way out of that is we call it the split reverse sample. So that we take our sample and half of them get the, the active compound first and the other half get the placebo first and we combine the results to, to sort of counterbalance the impact. Finally, we've got the matched pairs design. This is by far and away the least commonly practiced form of design. <coughs> It's exactly the same as the independent groups, but the participants are closely matched in terms of a key variable, for example, age, ethnicity, IQ scores, whatever. Now, the characteristics for matching must be relevant to the study. For example, you wouldn't bother matching participants on gender if you're testing memory, unless you've got some evidence suggesting that women have better memories than men, or men have better memories than women. And actually, you can find some of this evidence here. You see, this is a brain scan overlay so that the, the pink bits are supposed to show us the bits of the brain structure that are more developed in women and the blue bits, the bits of the brain structure, more developed in men. And if we assume that this here is the, the hippocampus and stuff, I think, maybe then, uh, I don't know, it's part of the brain that's associated with memory, say. That would seem to indicate that there is a gender difference, a, sorry, a sex difference in uh, memory function. So the classic matched pair study is a twin study. Participants are matched for genetic heritage. And this controls all the biologically determined individual differences. So it allows the experiment to state with a very high degree of confidence the effect that the IV is having on the DV, because other significantly determining characteristics have all been matched out. So here's my example for you then. We might want to test the impact of cosmetics on attractiveness. We want to control for the participants' estimates of attractiveness being influenced by previous perceptions of the stimulus. Selection of faces could be photographed before and after being made up by the same makeup artist, so that it's not, a, not down to the makeup artist's talent, and it's the same face in both cases. So we'd show the faces to the matched pairs of participants, the twins. They'd be asked to rate each photograph for attractiveness using a common scale, say a score out of 10. Then, provided the first twin saw only the unmade up face and the second twin only saw the made up face, we could compare their scores for each measure and so work out what the impact of the cosmetics was on the score awarded. 